And uh, Marco, you have the first item that I made you put on there, so <laughs> take it away. <laughs> so <Sorry>. yeah, <laughs> no, it's fine. So it, this just came up after me and Bob just had coffee chat just now, and we decided to just discuss this. Discuss tea. it. The whole we thing. had tea. Tea chat, yeah. Well, it's a water for me, but yeah. Um, yeah. So a little bit of context is that. Let me just share my screen to start with. So uh, in Sidekick, we recently rolled out the um, per shard SLI, so where we aggregate um, SLI, for example, for Sidekick execution and um, Sidekick queuing um, in a shard uh, in a shard level. So what that means is that in the metrics catalog now, um, if we specify monitoring shard unable to true, then um, the all the SLIs in Sidekick service will be will have the shard level monitoring, and then. Um, but you can uh, each SLI can opt out uh, using this flag. So let's say for LM completion, we don't want the SLI to be aggregated by shard, so we can just put it as false. Um, so that's that. And then originally we had to, for each of the shard, they will have the um, alert SLO, which follows this 99.5%. But um, as time goes by, we, we realize that each shard doesn't perform to this um, app deck standard. So we have to override each shard's SLI. So for example, now we already have this um, feature whereby we can, we can have the um, monitoring shard overrides for psychic execution. For example, for urgent authorized projects, we know that like this shard doesn't perform that well. So we can override this too. Uh, ninety-five percent appdex, for example. So, the idea for this uh, monitoring object is that we wanna move as much um, as we had, um, for example, in the monitoring thresholds into this um, monitoring object. So, um, so not shard just is the, one. Not just the monitoring threshold, but also um, SLI specific stuff. Like, um, I you haven't shown that yet, Marco, but you can yep. also yep. specify. Uh, an SLI for us and an SLO for a specific SLI, so it doesn't use the global definition that is currently in monitoring thresholds. Yep. So what we came up just now is the, um, yep. So this is what we are going to um, envision. So um, we would then have this thresholds that will be applied for, it's like the default fallback for all SLIs that are shard level monitored. And then, um, so yeah. And for the, for, then for example, if you're talking about a single SLI for psychic execution, this shards will follow the specified app decks, but the rest will then follow like this thresholds object. So this thresholds object will be in the shape that is going to be replicated in another key, for example, the monitoring global. So this monitoring global, then we can also have the thresholds. So basically this app deck score will be, will, will replace this monitoring thresholds that we have down here. If that makes sense, and then, and then previously we also have the monitoring thresholds to to apply it in each of the SLI, so that will be replaced in this overrides um, object. Yeah, did I get it right, Bob? Yes. So uh, the gist is that then we get um, the added functionality we get is we get to pick a separate SLO for a specific label set. For example, uh, shard equals urgent authorized projects. Those are the SLIs. We also get to uh, keep 
what we had before is this specific SLI, Sidekick Execution, gets a different SLO than the entire service does. Um, and we thought that um, it's nicer to have all of these SLOs inside this thing, single monitoring stanza rather than sprinkled across the different SLIs we have now. Uh, we just came up with that like 15 minutes ago, but if anybody <laughs> has any feedback already, that would be awesome. <laughs> No, it's great we can override those those things i i just thought um it's very similar for capacity planning perhaps so um we can already override capacity planning planning settings for a service i think um and i was wondering if we could somehow sort of combine those things so that we don't end up overriding the monitoring part at once or the slos in one part and manage the capacity planning things in the other part maybe that's something we can even um merge together so that we we manage all the overrides in in one place I don't know if that makes sense um I think I think it does but um right now if I remember correctly the overrides are also defined on a per service uh in a service like inside this this file is that mm -hmm. correct mm -hmm. um I think we should um pay attention that we make both things kind of look the same but I don't think we should put them together. The reason I don't think that is because the SLIs that these thresholds apply for um, are defined inside the service, like um, for now. Uh, while the saturation points apply to multiple services and they live elsewhere. So I think it makes sense to keep them kind of next to each other and not merge mm -hmm. them together. What do you think? Okay, yeah, that's fair. Um, but um, um, Marco, if you write this up somewhere in the issue that you're already working on, then maybe we can continue the discussion there with some code examples. That's going to be easier to see what we're what we what we're talking about because I think it would be nice if they looked the same. Yep. And this isn't specific to psychic shards, is it? It could be any. Anything sort of that's shard, yes. Nice. yes. Mm -hmm. That's also, I recently created an issue somewhere that I'm going to find and link in the agenda, but um, some of the things that we currently call services could actually be shards, like lots, lots of the, like we have many Patroni services, but actually they could be shards, for example. We used to have them as separate services because... Um, we wanted to be able to apply different thresholds to SLIs and all of that stuff, but that's now possible with the work that Marco has do been doing. Uh, I don't have the agenda in front of me. Who's next? Grime, yeah. I think it was you. Yeah, probably be me. Um, so I am just, just, for interest sake, for those who are interested, I'm going to give a quick overview of some of the work we're doing on the runway pipeline. And this is the first major change we've had to the runway uh, pipeline. And when I mean the runway pipeline, it's like the deployment pipeline that a user goes through for when they're, they're using runway, um, which is going to unlock some things, but also has some, unfortunately, uh, some, some, some drawbacks. So this is currently how a... Um, uh, a pipeline with runway enabled would look like. This is a very simplified version of the current AI assist pipeline. We just build the container image. Um, and then this section here onwards, the runway stage is basically the runway uh, CI snippet that you include. So this is all provided by runway. We do some validation and then we do a downstream trigger into the deployment project, which does pre-flight check, change lock check, and then does your staging deployment, your monitor, your promotion, then your production deployment, production monitor. Um, so it's all fairly simple. There's just one stage and what have you. The problem arises with, and so the, the code suggestion team have pointed out to us is after they deploy to staging, they actually wanna have their own jobs run that run QA. So in the case of code suggestions, they wanna run the GitLab QA um, against say staging, which is pointing to staging code suggestions deployed by runway 
and part of the test suite that we have in GitLab is testing code suggestions with the, the Rails models and all, all that good stuff, right? So essentially they want to have their own tasks run after the deploy to staging that they can do some validation in staging. Um, but because, as I mentioned, everything this side onwards is owned by us and because of the way GitLab CI works and, and all that kind of fun stuff. And because all of this happens in the deployment project, not in the service project, currently there's no way to do that. There's just one trigger and it goes straight to staging and then monitor, promote straight to production. There's just no way to kind of change any of that. So I have an MR up to refactor the CI, custom, CI setup to be more customizable. Um, makes sense, pretty simple. Uh, there's a lot going in there, but I won't, go into too much detail, but what it changes that is to look like this. Uh, so it looks a little bit different. I, I might have my font up too loud. Yeah, okay. GitLab CI user interface is not very good for long pipelines. Um, so you can see once again, we build the gate, the, we build the model gateway, but instead of having one stage called runway and just triggering everything into the deployment pipeline, we now have three stages. We have runway staging, runway validate and promote, and runway production. And you can see here that we do the same thing, construct and validate runway configuration, trigger runway deployment staging, we promote, and then we trigger runway deployment production. And these, these going from one trigger and everything in the deployment project to two triggers, and each one of these now in the deployment project um, just do that environment, right? So production, and this one is for staging. So there's the pre-flight staging monitor. So essentially we're moving, we're going from one fixed pipeline in the deployment project. We're moving that. So the deployment project still just does the deployment part, but now the orchestration of staging, then promote, then pro um, you know production uh, is back in the service project, if that makes sense. So the user can actually add their own tasks. So um, Sylvester did, did a, an example here in his project. So he's got a whole bunch of jobs here, but um, once again, you've got runway staging, runway validate, promote runway production. And he was able to add, you know, his own QA job here. So after the deployment to staging happened, um, before we promote, we can do a dummy QA and then before we do the production. So it gives people the ability to customize the runway pipeline a little bit more. What are the downsides? Quite big actually. The more we push into the service project, the more we have to rely on the user, the less control we have, and the more we have to rely on the user doing the right thing, either deliberately or you know accidentally. And for, as an example, these stages, because they have to get defined uh, separately in the user service file, we rely on them putting runway staging, then runway production as the order, but they could flip that. Maybe it's an accident in the way they put it in the file. Um, variables can be passed to these jobs from the service project, which could impact things um, and go against some of the safety mechanisms we have to make sure people are deploying to the right service because um, they can change the runway service ID, which means they might deploy into a different service. All of these kind of problems uh, happen when you start pushing CI configuration into the service project. So by giving them the flexibility to control the runway deployment, we also give them the power to go off the golden path, essentially. I don't particularly like this solution, but given the state of GitLab CI and the product, I can't see many options. There is work within the company to do GitLab steps, I think it's called GitLab CI steps, which allows you will to define GitLab CI snippets that you can't override and you can't take, uh, so you basically give inputs to, but you can't, if you change a variable globally, it doesn't get, you know, kind of absorbed into the snippet and what have you. That may be useful to us and kind of alleviate some of these problems. Um, but yeah, overall, I find it a very interesting kind of problem space. Because once again, to me, it's a bit of a, it, it's a little bit of a kind of crisis of runway itself because it's designed to be this, I, I find I have these problems a lot. People keep telling me, like the goal was to do this, like everyone keeps telling me, do everything for us, like take it away, build the image, do everything. And I want I don't want to have to do anything. I just drop the file in and it all works. 
And then at the same time, we also have people like, oh, actually, I want to, I want, I've had this custom requirement. I want this. And now I want you to do this custom thing here and everything. And it's like, so you want me to make something that's simple and like easy and works and is locked down, but is also completely customizable and you can kind of do whatever requirement you want. Uh, yes, please do that. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So and, I need not to have to do of... anything, but change anything exactly. I want at any time. That's the base exactly. requirement for everything, right? <laughs> So it kind of becomes like we kind of reinvent GitLab CI in general. I, 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 I make it sound worse than it is, but it is, as I said, it's an interesting problem space when you think about it. Um, I think we'll go with this approach. I think it's a fine approach, you know, with, with the limitations and what have you. Um, but as I said, it is interesting to see. And it's a big part of, um, this is in, in delivery. Um, we, we have this kind of problem all the time as well, trying to orchestrate things and doing the right level of, power and control and and everything hopefully some of these features that they do talk about in the products will come soon because i do think that will make runway uh, especially on the deployment side a lot a lot easier um, because we will be able to say here is a runway uh ci configuration you can have and you can't change it like you can only change these things even if it is customizing jobs, but they can't change other things, which will just up the security level a bit more. And then eventually will allow us to drop the deployment project because we will be confident enough that no matter what users do in the service project, they can't do the wrong thing. That That is the real thing. We want to make sure that they have the, the tweaks and the knobs available to them, but they can't do the wrong thing accidentally um or deliberately but i don't think people would do that accidentally because you know it can happen mistakes get made and um you know and also for things like compliance and so forth we need to make sure certain things happen in certain orders like for example deploying to production before you deploy to staging you know probably don't want people to do that cool I don't want to. I was going to say I don't want to massively derail, but if there's if there's nothing else, um, and because we've got a couple of people in the room or a few people in the room that might be interested and haven't seen it yet, did you look into the kind of GitLab Flow demo, Graham, with Temporal and other things like that? And does that look like an interesting module based thing? that could potentially um, help us out here over the long term if that becomes adopted within GitLab. And I'll, I'll try and grab that link now. Yeah, so I, I did have a look at that. So for those in the group who haven't looked at it yet, you should go. It's a, it's a bit of a long demo, but it's quite interesting um, to follow through. Um, it's essentially using a piece of software called Temporal as a workflow engine inside of GitLab. Um, I think it has a lot of potential. So I commented on the issue. I think it has a huge potential. Um, I, I can talk about a lot of different ways it might help us in delivery, but certainly focusing on on, on uh, this meeting, I think for scalability, I think for runway, it could be very useful. Um, so there's a few parts to kind of how, how this demo and everything's put together. One is having proper eventing coming out of GitLab. So you can say, when an issue is created, when an issue is updated, when a deployment is created, you know, I'm going to assume any kind of event that happens within GitLab, you know, we can have essentially a piece of, I'm going to get all the terminology wrong, but I essentially you can have a client or uh, kind of pick up on those events. And essentially then you can have temporal access like a workflow engine and you write your workflow in, in whatever language you want and all this thing. And workflow is, it's kind of like a GitLab CI replacement. I, I that's how I kind of see it, and um, not not really. It's it's not really like GitLab CI, but it's kind of what we use GitLab CI for. Currently, whenever we want to do a workflow within GitLab, typically we use GitLab CI. That's pretty much what we do for whether it's restoring a backup, whether it's deploying software and what have you, whether it's um running a scheduled job to update uh, issues with things. You know, we typically typically run that kind of stuff um, as some code running in container running in GitLab CI. Whereas this demo is about basically taking that eventing part out of GitLab and being able to 
better write workflows that can do things with real code, which can call APIs and you know interact with external systems and what have you. Um, a use case that I could see, for example, one one that's very very clear to me that I saw is if we could get events out of GitLab every time. So if the events could go down to Giddily level, so Giddily in terms of like what files are being added and changed, and maybe we could subscribe to certain events from that. If we could say every time a project within GL Infra, say, commits a file called runway.yaml in the .runway directory in any Git repo, we would have the workflow trigger our provisioner, which would run Terraform and onboard that service automatically. So that, as an example, means all someone would have to do to onboard their service in Runway is just create a Runway file and commit it. And it would just happen. Like we would provision you and it would be you know, instantaneous within a minute or two, you'd be ready to go. And likewise, offboarding, we could say, you know, we could sub subscribe to events and say, when a runway file is deleted from a repo, please run in the provisioner and de like deprovision that service and, and clean it up and delete it. That straight away was like an immediate use case where we can, it's kind of like, because GitLab CI is all bound into single projects. And, you know, that's why we have this problem with the deployment project and all of these kind of bandages as around the security model being project focused. Whereas we had this kind of event bus that we could control and orchestrate outside of that we could do all sorts of things. We could do we could do proper deployments. We could replace GitLab CI deployments like I've got there with with proper deployments with a lot more complicated stuff and um and, and a lot more basically because you can write it in a full language, I think you can basically orchestrate any workflow you want, you know, however you want. The downside immediate to me was that the user experience just is it is harder, right? You don't the great thing about GitLab CI is you can, like I showed earlier, you just go into your project, you click on your commit, you get the pipeline, you get the little boxes and you see everything that happened. And if there's a problem, you see the red box and everything. Whereas um, the GitLab flow stuff brilliantly like works, but I, I, I would like to see how that would be kind of presented. Like how could we draw that workflow and out to the user? So you can say, Yep, you committed a file, and by the way, this ran this workflow, and it failed, and this might be why. Kind of, I, I don't know what screen that would sit on, how you would pull that out, but I, I do see GitLab being able to like provide that information to the user. But it's kind of like that duplicating of GitLab CI in an effect, because it's a different workflow engine, but a much better for certain uh, workflow engine for certain jobs. It was a cool demo. I'd uh, I'd encourage you to watch it. I think there's a uh, there's definitely that debate about you know we're not necessarily looking to replace GitLab CI, <laughs> which is a contentious thing whenever anyone brings a new workflow engine in, and the first question. Um, but some of the durable execution stuff I think is quite interesting, and especially the way they look at um, domain specific languages and modules. That could be a, you know, bring your own module for your QA staging tests um, and it slots in here, but all of the rest of it is completely idempotent and will always execute the same way, um, which for, for some of the deployment stuff versus the continuous integration, I think is, is super interesting. Agreed. The robustness of it, it was very, very, very nice. Like, um, yeah, it was, it was very, very good. And and just obviously a lot more lightweight um, than GitLab like GitLab CI. You're not spinning up a whole virtual machine just to run the code that you want to do something like. I think that kills us a lot. Um, right tool for the job. Right tool for the job. And I think this definitely looks like the right tool for specific kind of actual workflow execution stuff, not just hammering everything into containers in GitLab CI. All right. Thanks so much, uh, Graham. Thanks, Sam, for bringing that on up as well. Appreciate it. All right. We have no other agenda. I want to continue encouraging us to continue putting up these demos. 
always remain, remember, they don't need to be fully fleshed. Put anything that comes up and we can have a discussion around it. Thank you so much.